like to introduce Rebecca King. Her work at the foundation is focused on advocating for hypersomnia research, access and affordability of medical care and prescription medications, and increasing the understanding of hypersomnias. Prior to receiving an idiopathic hypersomnia slash narcolepsy type 2 diagnosis and joining the Hypersomnia Foundation on the board of directors, Rebecca's career included service in the US as a US Army officer, in leadership roles in the in, in, in insurance industry, and small business ownership. Rebecca, please come forward. Hi, everybody. Last but not least, we're going to talk about how the Hypersomnia Foundation supports research. So I don't know about you, but I've had the pleasure of listening to some amazing presentations over the last day and a half. And as you can tell, there's a lot of researchers out there pulling, putting their heart and soul into trying to figure out the problems that we face in hypersomnia. But there are obviously a lot of unanswered questions out there. We are still idiopathic, both IH and narcolepsy type 2. We do not know what the cause is. So the Hypersomnia Foundation has made it part of its mission to do what we can to support our research community. So first, you have to understand what do researchers need in order to do all this research? And I wish it was as easy as you have a great idea and you run down to the NIH and you tell them about their great idea and they shower you with millions of dollars and you get to do your research, but that's not really how it works. You have to fill out an incredibly detailed application. You have to have a great idea. You have to have all the right smart people on your team. You have to have equipment and samples. But actually, the thing that you really, really need is you have to have initial research results that are compelling enough to demonstrate to the NIH that your idea already has sort of shown itself to be a good one and it's worth further investment. And so getting those initial research results in order to apply for an NIH grant or another big grant is really, really challenging. And in order to do that, you have to do initial research. You have to have your great idea, all the smart people, all the access to equipment, and most of all, you have to have funding because this stuff is expensive. And you can't get it from the government. So this is where foundations like ourselves can have a role to play in helping research to get off the ground so that someday it can turn into a larger grant and major discoveries. So the Hypersomnia Foundation about eight years ago did ask the community for some funds to say, we want to support research. And we had a little pot of money, and we started a research program and put it on our website and printed out flower, flyers and, and went out there. And one of the major things that we wanted to make sure in setting up a research fund program is that the goals of the research are in alignment with the community who gave the funds. So fortunately, at this time, there had been a survey of the community asking what you all thought were the most important things to do research on. And unsurprisingly, the number one answer is, what is the cause <laughs> of idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2? And so in kind of the medical science world, when you discover a cause, it's generally called an etiology. So the second thing, the phenotypes, are we believe that there's probably multiple underlying causes of uh, hypersomnia. And I think we heard Dr. Mignot talk about some of his thoughts about what it might be. But anytime you have like a distinct cause for a group of people, you, do, you call that a phenotype. And then biomarkers is another word we've heard a lot this weekend. Some sort of test, some sort of way to demonstrate that a particular cause for the disorder is present in an individual, and we really don't have any biomarkers. It really would be a dream in order to have biomarkers to be able to say, for sure, this individual, it, their symptoms are being caused by this breakdown or this element. And the fourth thing that came out of the survey was a desire for personalized medicine. 
meaning that the more we can understand the disease that a specific individual has, the more we can figure out which medications are likely to give them relief. Today, we're a little bit in a world where we're lucky in that we have a decently long list of medications available to us, but we kind of have to throw them all at the wall and see what sticks. And that's a really awful process. I've been through it. I'm sure many of you have been through it and continue to go through it. So wouldn't it be fabulous if someday we really had medicines designed to help treat um, specific phenotypes of hypersomnia? And of course, uh, in addition to these priorities, what we really want our program to do is fund initial research that someday can turn into a larger grant. So we started our program. We had a couple small grants, but it wasn't quite doing exactly what we wanted to do, what we kind of envisioned. So we kind of sat back and looked at the program and said, what's going on here? And the first realization is we're kind of small potatoes. <laughs> The amount of money that we could give to any one grant was not enough to be compelling to enable a researcher to really do those initial research. Our second issue is we really didn't have enough reach to reach out into the research community and get awareness out there that we had this grant program. And the third issue we had is when we did receive applications, we didn't have the infrastructure and processes and procedures to be able to evaluate them and manage the award process. It's a very complicated process. So we actually, around this time, a couple years in, we were doing this assessment and we heard there was an AASM foundation. So AASM is the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And I think we've heard about them earlier in the, in the, in the weekend. The AASM is its own organization of doctors and researchers. But the AASM 25 years ago said, we would like to run grant programs to help research in sleep questions. So they started their own foundation. And those are the people that we uh, met. We got to know them. We're doing, trying to do similar things. And, and so we kind of had this proposal. What if we joined together to jointly fund research into hypersomnia? And the wonderful people at ASM Foundation said, we've never done that before, partnered with a patient foundation, but we're willing to give it a try. And so we did form a partnership. Now this has been so critical for us because they have lots of potatoes. <laughs> and in fact, the agreement that we came to in jointly funding research is for every $1 the Hypersomnia Foundation would put in, but their foundation would put in $3. So we're actually turning every one of your dollars into $4 to fund research. They also have tremendous global reach with email lists of thousands of people. And they also, their whole purpose for being is to be a grant funding institution. So they have incredibly robust procedures for running grant uh, applications, getting all sorts of professional researchers to evaluate those, you know, those proposals, make the right decisions, and to manage the research throughout the whole process. So what we were in little, they are in big, and they've been a tremendous partner. This is the very first time we went out in a, as a partnership in, uh, in 2022. So it actually starts the year before. In 2021, this is the advertisement that went out that we'd be making awards in the summer and fall of 2022. And as you can see in the center, there were three categories for applications, with the largest being $250,000. So this is a much, much more compelling opportunity for a researcher. So let's see what happened. So for the partnership, there were actually two grants given. One was a co-funded grant where the Hypersomnia Foundation put in $25,000 and AASM put in 75 for a total of $100,000 and that went to Dr. Maggie Blattner. So she came to us with a proposal to do sleep studies at home using remote technology. And I think we've been hearing a little bit about that this week and about how wouldn't it be great to do that. And in addition to having the person being tested, being in their comfortable home environment, the other advantage is they could keep the equipment for a couple of days. And so you could truly demonstrate how much sleep people are getting 
through a 24 or 36 or 48 hour period. So that's not really been tested in the United States yet, so she's going to do that for us. There was another proposal that the AASM Foundation uh, deemed is very worthy, and they went ahead and just funded in its entirety, and that's Dr. Eric Zhu, he's up at Boston Children's, and he uh, had a proposal to look at helping children with hypersomnia with some of the social challenges that they face. Also this year, there was another proposal that came to the partnership grant application, but it was rejected because it didn't really fit the profile of what the AASM Foundation funds. But um, the Hypersomnia Foundation saw that proposal and we went back home and had some conversations with them because we were kind of interested and we ended up giving them a direct grant. So these three gentlemen are all researchers in hypersomnia and they tend to do a lot of imaging studies. And the problem they were facing is everybody has a few patients and a few imaging studies. And they said, what if we could get all the researchers around the world who are doing imaging to pool the data together in one big consortium and one big database, then that would be a very rich data set to do research on. And so they've connected with all sorts of researchers across the globe, and what they needed was seed money to hire their initial staff and set up the initial infrastructure in order to build this big database. And so in, in summary, in 2022, there was a total of three programs that were funded um, between the Hypersomnia Foundation and AASM Foundation. So originally this was thought to be kind of a one-time deal that we do this partnership, um, but when we sat back and looked at what happened, both foundations were really excited about the number and quality of applications that came in and the, and the opportunities to really start doing something in hypersomnia. And so we asked, can we do it again? <laughs> and they said yes, and not only that, but Wake Up Narcolepsy had been watching what was going on and they're like, we wanna be a part of this as well. We'll co-fund a project. So in 2023, we ran another cycle and the Hypersomnia Foundation uh, chose a project to co-fund with AASM for Dr. Dovier, who was here yesterday, you all heard him. And he had an idea of doing a clinical trial in Solriempital for people with IH. So this medication, which is commonly known as Sinosi, has already been tested in people with narcolepsy and it's already been FDA approved, but there's nothing on the horizon to test it in people with IH. So we were really excited about the idea of saying, yes, we would like to know, is this medication another tool in the toolbox? If this clinical trial is successful, the bad news is it cannot be used in order to ask the FDA for approval. But what it can be done, uh, used for is to go back to the AASM to ask them to update the clinical practice guidelines. Right now, this medication is not on the clinical practice guidelines for IH, but wouldn't it be great if proven safe and effective, it could be added so all the doctors out there would know that this is another option for us. Another reason why we are hopeful that this particular clinical trial will be uh, proved that this is safe and effective is it could help with insurance appeals. So sometimes when uh, the medication is still gonna be off label, the FDA won't have approved it, but sometimes insurance companies will say for an off label medication, you need to prove to me that it's safe and effective by attaching like two clinical journal articles or something like that. So after doing a trial like this, Dr. Joby and his team it will publish papers to say if it's safe and effective. So when you have an insurance appeal, someday it would be great if you could attach the new AASM guideline saying this is a good medicine for IH, and here is a journal article written by the, the team that did it saying this is safe and effective to help get approval for the medication. Wake Up Narcolepsy co-funded with AASM Foundation this project, which is Dr. Laura Lewis up at MIT. So the great thing about this is she has never done any work in hypersomnia before. She's a basic sleep researcher. But she, uh, we met her a, a few years ago, a couple of us from the foundation, and we were trying to get her excited about hypersomnia. 
um, because you're like, you're, you're finding all sorts of cool stuff about sleep. Do you think you can see whether or not those cool things are happening in hypersomnia? So apparently, she thought about it for a couple of years because she came forward and said, I have an idea for doing research in hypersomnia. So for us, a lot of the activity that uh, regulates sleep is in the brainstem and hypothalamus, which are in the center of the brain. And unfortunately, most imaging has a really, really hard time getting to the center of the brain. And so she has access to a seven Tesla imaging machine, which is the you know, cutting edge technology in imaging. So she came to us to say, I don't even know <laughs> if we can see deep enough into the brain in order to tell the difference between somebody who's like a normal sleeper versus sleep deprived versus hypersomnia. But I'm willing to try and see if we can even test to see how far we can push this technology in order to see what, what we can see in the in, inside of the brain. So this is a moonshot project for us. And if she is able to come up with a way of seeing deep into the brain, then in the future, she'll need to come back and get more funding in order to do more additional research in hypersomnia. But we're hopeful that, that, that she'll be able to get there. In total, in 2023, there were four research projects funded. So the two top ones are the ones I just reviewed because they were the ones co-funded by HF and Wake Up Narcolepsy. At the bottom, um, there were also two additional projects that AASM Foundation funded themselves, one having to do with whether or not the keto diet might have an impact on hypersomnia symptoms, and the other imagery rehearsal therapy um, is taking a, a therapy that's been used to help people with PTSD have a lower um, incidence of having terrible nightmares. And so the idea was, could we take this kind of proven therapy, apply it to people with hypersomnia to help with their nightmares and hallucinations? So this year, the um, clinical trial for Dr. Dovier was a $250,000 grant. And our arrangement with the, their foundation is we put in 25%, so that's $62,500. And um, ASM Foundation put in the rent, but rest, but in total for this year, almost $700,000 went towards hypersomnia research. That was year two. <laughs> we are now at the tail end of year three. We are right now evaluating the grant applications that have been coming in through the winter. And in July and August, we'll be making final decisions about potentially co-funding uh, more research. Both Wake Up Narcolepsy and HF are participating. So the great news is, is that this partnership is continuing. The bad news is, is that um, that pot of money that we had when we set up the research program, we pretty much spent it. <laughs> so we just have a little bit left. And we would like to continue, and we, we will need some more support for the community. So I just wanted to say a few words about how fundraising happens for our foundation. This was something I didn't understand when I joined the foundation five years ago. So I came to the conference, and I'm like, this is all great. Uh, it looks you know, wonderful. But I never asked, where does the money come from? And the answer is there's two different ways that money comes into the foundation and they fund very different things. So on the left, all of our conferences and programming and social media and all the things that build content and experiences for our community are largely funded by the various gen very generous grants from our pharma partners. So that is a source that is very specific and it's, there, it's kind of specified what that money goes uh, to fund. Donations from the community have to fund everything else. And there's really kind of three major elements that depend on your donations. The first one is our staff and helping to pay their salary and benefits. Operations, you know, having an accounting company, paying for the mail, paying for the computer systems, all those operational nuts and bolts. And last but certainly not least, research funding. Any research funding we have to offer does have to come from our community. So we make it as easy as possible on our website to donate. There are a few different ways to donate where 100% of what you give comes to us. And those would be things like monthly transfers from your bank account or writing a check Facebook has a you know, zero fee way of donating. And then if you happen to have access to a company gift match, 
those are wonderful programs and really help build up your, the value of your donation. On our website, there are a couple of ways that are very easy and convenient, but they do have fees. You can just use a credit card on our website, PayPal, or Global Giving um, are three ways, and all of this can be found on the website at that QR code. So in summary, we started, we were small, we're finally starting to go, we're finally starting to build essentially a portfolio of research that is related to what you most care about. And I thank you so much for your support in the past, and we hope to continue to build our research, and I'm happy to take any questions. Are you planning any fundraising events or anything that you know people would be able to share with their community to, to try to increase donations? Not at this time. It's actually just, we've, we've just, gone to certain individuals that we know are interested in research, but we never have really shared with the whole community that there is this need. And so this year kind of is the first year I'm doing this presentation to try and make people aware. Because as I said, when I joined five years ago, I didn't, I didn't know that there was the need, so, but I definitely know now. <laughs> Can I just add to that? We do have an end of year uh, giving campaign, which is online, um, and that just starts usually the week before Thanksgiving and runs to the end of the calendar year. So it's just like it's mostly on social media. We do a push and we, you know review what we've done and the direction we want to go. But we're always open to ideas because um, people can do you know the smaller uh, fundraising activities, and we can get behind individuals if you wanted to do like a 5K or anything like even lemonade stands or whatever you however you feel creative and can tap into your community if you send us an email we can you know provide you with some support materials or you know share your project on social media and so on I, I don't have a project but my local um rotary club is successfully raffles off a corvette every year and I know there are other rotary clubs where they have like like a text so that you can you know it can be across, you know, wow. the U.S. and not just localized. And there's some Rotary Clubs that have done a raffle of a, of a, a car lease. So maybe if, you know, if we found a sponsor to help get us right. a car lease or something like right. that. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I, I have numbers to know how much they generally, like, raise on those, et cetera. But... Um, so I think ever since I was a kid, there's been something called 40 Hour Famine. I don't know if that's international and you all know about it, but um, through high schools and schools, kids get sponsorship to not eat for 40 hours and see what it feels like to be a, a hungry person and the money goes to communities where there's food poverty. You could maybe do something like a sleepathon for, you know, like either the opposite where you have to stay awake for two or three days and feel like how your family member feels all the time, or sleep, you know, try and sleep for 40 hours or something, and get sponsorship to actually raise awareness of what our loved ones are going through, but also do a fundraiser that way. It was just a thought. Thank you. Actually, Project Sleep, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Project Sleep's work. They actually do have a sleep in over Sleep Week in March, so. Um, that idea has been running for quite a few few years and they use it as a fundraiser as well. But you're right, I think it's, it's great because it raises money but also raises awareness. So. so Rebecca Slide mentioned a corporate match. So if you work at a big company and you can donate, like, say, $50 and your company can, do can match that, it becomes $100. And then if you... Then the... AASM will add three more on top of that to $400, so a $50 donation can become $400. Yeah. So if you are able, if you work at one of those companies that has a matching program, like this can give you like a huge return on whatever little amount you can contribute. So nothing is too small. Thank you.